didn't mention, I'm, I'm also an author. I'm in the process of uh, launching my third book um, this month, which is the A-Game Sales and Marketing Manual. Um, so I'm pursuing to break a record. I don't know if anybody has done this, um, but it's my own personal record at the end of the day. In 12 months time, or in November, I'm trying to, to publish three books. Um, so I'm on my second one now. So I'm doing a leadership book, and maybe we can talk about potential collaboration in that by November. Do you mind if, OK, I'll be able to see, I guess. All right, you know, they, <coughs> they tend to say when people start to speak, they normally start with jokes, or rather Americans start with jokes. Um, you know, the Asians would start with the bow, but South Africans will start with an excuse. <laughs> but I, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I don't have excuses for you today, OK? okay. All right, so what my business does, as Robin mentioned, we, implement, we help companies to define business strategies. We also uh, then coach companies through the implementations of those strategies, um, as well as sales and customer relationship management, and lastly, business processes uh, for operational efficiencies. These are some of the clients that we've worked with in the past. Yes, a lot of them are large corporates, but the work that we do for them is with regards to the um, development of their supplier, uh, supplier base, as well as other small businesses that they may be uh, supporting in one way or another. And some are, yes, uh, small businesses. One, I guess, one success story is um, Robert Pasha, who is um, for, from Pasha Transport. You can imagine a typical um, taxi business um, how it operates and you know whether they obey the law or not is something else. But we helped um, Pasha um, to secure a five million rand annual turnover, or rather a five million rand um, annual revenue contract with UNISA through implementing business processes and systems and helping them comply with what UNISA required. So that's kind of um, the type of uh, implementations or, or assistance that we um, help companies. So what makes us different is that we have a very specific methodology called the A-Game Business Blueprint. Um, it's an online course, it's a book, as well as uh, pretty much a series of books, as well as workshops that we facilitate. So today, I'm going to give you pretty much a taste of that um, around systems and, and processes, which is, speaks to the expansion or the, the amplification of your business. So my, from what I understand is you guys are, you know, are, at a certain level of your business where you're no longer in what's called a rut, but you are actually looking to grow and expand your business. So I'm going to share some, some, I guess, things I've uh, gotten to learn over the last couple of years in terms of things that you can implement um, to help you achieve that. The message today, as I'm sure you know, if you keep doing the same thing, you'll always get what you've always gotten. And I'm going to share some ideas in terms of how you can shift that. Warning. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme, OK? It's a little complicated. Um, or rather, it's simple, but not easy to implement if one can tell the difference, right? There are certain logical sequences that one can follow. But because it's a long life, uh, a lifelong, rather, lifelong journey to, to, to achieve, I think, what we'd like to achieve in growing one's business and maintaining it and uh, keeping it sustainable, that it's not as simple, uh, or rather, as easy as we, we would all like it to be, right? But good things and great things in life require hard work. So we've got a lot to cover. It may be overwhelming. Um, I will stick um, to the time. There may be certain slides that I do not cover, um, but I'm sure it will be because I would have spent enough time on some of the slides, OK? Uh, how do you normally facilitate these sessions? Do you allow for questions in between, or would you rather? Yeah, if you have a question that's not going to derail, that's fine. OK, because great. Do the questions at the end. All right, perfect. Perfect. All right. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to spend some time creating context first, OK? So that we understand where, what, where processes and systems fit in, all right? Yes, you can start with just implementing processes, but trust me, they'll be fragmented from your strategy. Remember, your strategy is something that you want to um, have in place because it's going to help you really be uh, on the right journey, um, remain consistent, and, and, and ensure that the rest of your team are also um, aware of where you, your business, and them, where they should be working on or contributing towards in terms of getting to your final uh, destination. So think of where you are now. Um, 
as a certain place and you are trying to get somewhere else, which is maybe your ultimate goal or your, your aspirations or your strategic goal in the next few years, and think of the business strategy pretty much as the bridge that's going to um, help you get there. The purpose of a business strategy more than anything is to galvanize the team in your company. Okay? Sometimes we tend to have, uh, have an idea of where we want to be, but unless if it's on a document or we can easily share it with others in our, in our companies, it's not as easy as we'd like it or as simple as we'd like it to, to believe in terms of where we'd like to, to get to. Now, a lot of us tend to think because we have a business plan then we have a strategy. Those are two different documents. Right? The, business the business plan is a document that speaks to mainly external parties. Right? So think of banks, think of external partners, and potentially even suppliers. But what a business strategy does is it's an internal document, and it speaks to your day-to-day -day execution of your tactical, um, your tactical goals. Right? The day-to-day, -day, and I'm sure you've, you've worked on your own business plans and you've seen other business plans. You'll see that they don't speak to what people should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis to achieve whatever strategic goal you have. Remember what I'm doing? I'm creating context for why we need processes and where we actually start in, in terms of actually implementing effective business processes. So as mentioned earlier, if you don't have an effective or smart strategy in place, your processes will be fragmented. Um, what you want to do with your strategy, this is our methodology that we use. You want to look at your shareholder aspirations in terms of what you and other partners in your business would like to achieve. You want to look at your core values, right, which advises your, your, your culture at the end of the day. Um, and I'm sure you've heard the saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast, and it's true. You may have a strategy in place, but if your culture is wrong and doesn't allow or enable you to execute on the strategy, you can pretty much forget about achieving your strategic goals. Core purpose speaks to obviously the why we are in business, the vision that we'd like to achieve, ideally between three to five years, and your SWOT analysis, which speaks to competitors and so forth. So your the, all the components in your strategy will help you better understand the type of processes you need to have in place, right? Because it'll advise in terms of your competition. How do you implement processes that will help you uh, beat your competition? It'll help you. Um, implement processes that speak to your culture, right? That speaks to how you want to treat your customers and so forth, right? As well as, uh, and obviously the resources that you need to have in place, including the type of people, skills, and roles in that particular business. All right, I know I'm preaching to the choir, to the converted. We know that businesses fail. Um, there are reasons, right? There are reasons why, and there are many reasons. People will say it's because of finance, it's because of this and that. I'm not gonna try and tell you um, that my, my gospel is the truth or whatever the case may be, but there are many reasons why businesses fail, okay? Uh, but I do know that one of them is because of a lack of processes and systems. Because what typically happens with a lot of small businesses, you remove the business owner, the business doesn't function, right? And it's predominantly because of a lack of consistent and repeatable business processes. All right, systems of failing business, we waste hundreds of hours in business, you're always in reaction mode, um, for example, the situation with somebody not knowing uh, or rather having double booked themselves, lack of process. There is a process that one follows when you book meetings, okay? You book your meeting, you put it in your Outlook or whatever calendar you use, right? And you don't just agree to meetings over the phone without looking at your calendar. I think it's as simple as that, right? But sometimes simple doesn't translate to easy, right? So it's, again, it's just a matter of implementing processes. Something that I would like at least to leave you with today. Every single frustration you have in business is because you lack a process for it. Okay, always remember that if there's anything in business that frustrates you, doesn't get done or doesn't get done properly, it's either because of a lack of a process or your process is inefficient. All right, and obviously failing businesses have challenges with managing cash flow which leads to lack of productivity, you lose opportunities, and so forth. All right, implementing business processes will really is what will help you gain operational um, consistency, and ultimately, which is that entrepreneurial freedom that I think most of us aspire to have. The freedom to choose where we wanna work, when we wanna work, more importantly, and obviously, you know, the wealth that we'd all like to generate, uh, whether for ourselves and others, and in the hope that 
someday we'll buy ourselves the time that will help us you know, fulfill our personal purpose. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the traits of a successful business, which I'm, I'm sure all of us kind of have an idea of what those are. Again, this is about context. Um, the next few slides will get technical um, in terms of uh, the implementation of processes and systems. So the seven traits of uh, a successful business are as follows. Right? They, deliver, they deliver great value. Sometimes I actually have a McDonald's Golden Arches logo here because... Uh, you know, it's been said that they have some of the most amazing uh, processes in place, and I've seen some of those. Uh, yes, you'll get your odd McDonald's that doesn't um, deliver the right kind of, the right taste in your Big Mac, but hardly, hardly, right? It may be late, but generally it will probably taste just as well as whether you're buying one in Santon, Soweto, or whatever the case may be. So we generally um, use McDonald's as our uh, example, or uh, I guess, a company that you can aspire to. And here's the thing. McDonald's started, you know, small, like most businesses. And I think sometimes we tend to forget that the large corporations that we know now started small. And processes are one of those key um, ingredients that help them to get to that level. So back to the seven traits. Consistency in delivering that value. They deliver value, but they're very consistent in delivering that value, which is very key. They are process dependent. We're going to spend some time on what process dependent is. Can I ask what do you think process dependency is? Can anybody attempt or does anybody have an answer? I would assume it's obviously your business being completely reliant on processes to deal with situations. 100%, right? It means it's not dependent on you, but it's dependent on processes. It's not dependent on any one particular individual in the business. Again, if you look at uh, McDonald's, McDonald's has got one of the highest um, staff turnover uh, rates, um, ratios in, in, in business. But they still have that consistency. And I'm going to say something that may be offensive, but the reason why, and the trick is when you implement your processes, implement your processes such that even the dumbest person can do what you need them to do. Okay, that's how detailed your processes need to be. So that anyone who comes in knows precisely what they need to do. And you can at least transfer that skill in a very short space of time. And should that person leave, the next person that comes in can catch up pretty quickly. Okay. So again, process dependency speaks to how do you let this business, how do you enable this business to function um, or to rely on processes and not on you or on any other individual. So trait number four, technology and systems. Successful businesses harness um, processes and systems. They have happy and loyal customers, and I think those last two we, we would love to achieve, which is healthy profits and fulfilled owners and staff. Okay. Folks, these type of businesses do exist out there, and we do get in touch with them in some cases. And it's just a matter of how do we, um, um, how do we repeat that for ourselves or achieve it. So a process-dependent business basically is the kind of business where, uh, where Activities all happen without the reliance on the business owner. Again, the business functions regardless of where, whether the business owner is around or not. And these include the generation of, uh, of, of uh, leads as well as the conversion thereof, uh, fulfilling the promises made to the customer, uh, the invoicing and collecting of payments, and hiring staff. There is nothing as beautiful as being a business owner and one day walking into your business and you see somebody working that you've never met before because your business employed that person and you had nothing to do with it. Okay, don't you think that would be a great thing to actually experience? But that's when you know your business is at least achieving uh, its goal of being process dependent. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> let me just skip this. But maybe, maybe this point that I've highlighted here may be useful. Did you know that you, you can double the value of your business as it is just by implementing processes? So take your business as it is, apply processes and systems, you'll double it in the value. So that the day you sell it off or sell a portion thereof, you'll get twice as much. Okay. Because it's not reliant on you, right? You can easily, you can easily leave the business or should something happen to you, um, God forbid, the business can still be sold at that value because it's not reliant on you, okay? 
And obviously business continuity will apply when the business can function without you. But the unfortunate truth is a lot of us are trapped in our businesses. Okay, and the rest of the slides, I'm gonna to talk to how you can get yourself out of that cage. All right, and it's about working on your business and not in your business. I'm sure you've heard this phrase before. So how do we implement processes? As mentioned, it starts with your business strategy. Remember those key components in your strategy? You want to have those in place, or at least an idea thereof. Because if you don't start with your strategy, your processes will be fragmented. You know, everybody will have their own idea around what needs to be achieved in the long run. Yes, people know how to uh, book a meeting, pick up a phone and make a sales call or whatever the case may be, but if you and I don't have a collective idea from a culture perspective, from a purpose perspective, trust me, we will do that call differently if we work in the same business. So it's important that you start with a strategy in place. The next thing is to list the processes that are required to achieve your strategic goal, okay? It's gonna start getting a little technical now. So um, I, let me suggest that you take notes. And if something is a little too technical here, I, I allow you to please um, you know, stop me and then I'll, I'll, I'll go over a point to whatever the case may be. No. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, there was a joke. Robin already has a copy, right? Um, so he'll send it to, to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And again, I'm always happy to, you know, to take a call or two and email or whatever the case may be. Um, and obviously, if you need me to help you more with that, uh, you know, I'd be uh, more than willing. So when it comes to business processes, the list that you make, Remember, the idea here is to list the processes first, okay? Strategy, you look at your list. I'm going to show you how to segment or to categorize those lists. We use our, the, the methodology we use is called the four-pillar business uh, process development um, uh, methodology. And it looks at four pillars, which are initially your business strategy. Then you, op well, you can go in any sequence, but um, as listed, operations, client fulfillment. Client fulfillment speaks to the delivery of the promise that you make, right? So the products and services and how you go about delivering those products and services. And then sales and marketing obviously um, speaks to, I think is the most, so how I start my next book, the one that's coming out this month is sales and marketing are probably the three most used words in business. Yeah, it's just something that we all use, sales and marketing, sales and marketing, but we have a different idea around what that is. So delving into that particular pillar will help you to extrapolate what, what that actually means for your business, right? Every business is different, um, but at the same time, I always say, you know, business is business is business, right? People always ask me, what is your expertise or what do you specialize in? And I say business, and they say, what's that? And I say, look, you know, the principles of business are predominantly the same. A business is there to provide a value, you have customers, and it's about finding the best way to actually achieve that, right? So I, I love the fact that I don't necessarily specialize in any particular industry because having experienced all the different, or as many different industries as I have is my, actually my strength because I'm able to draw from all of these different industries when we work with certain companies, okay? Which is very good for purposes of uh, <coughs> developing competitive edges uh, in, the, in, in the, you know, the environment that we, we specialize in or rather that we are trading in these days. So in listing your processes, categorize them using these four pillars. And then the next thing is to understand that each one of these pillars uh, should be broken down into three uh, different um, layers, right? So you have the pillars. Each pillar will have categories, right? So. Remember we spoke about sales and marketing as a pillar, right? So now what we're doing is we're just going one or two levels deeper into one of the pillars. You have sales and marketing as a pillar and below that you would then list different categories, right? Now the categories in this particular pillar, marketing strategy is a pillar on its own. You'll have marketing and one layer down under marketing strategy, then you list the processes. Does it make sense so far? All right? So you have four pillars. What we're doing is we're looking at the sales and marketing pillar. 
we're going to look at the different categories of processes inside sales and marketing, and then we're going to list processes underneath each one of those categories. Does it make sense? All right. And what you'll be interested to know is that the processes that you list under your category is actually what goes into your job descriptions. What we tend to do is we take job descriptions and we copy them from the internet, we Google or whatever the case may be. That is definitely the wrong approach to use because what you're doing is you're assuming that somebody else um, knows exactly how your business is supposed to function. Okay? There's nothing wrong with changing your job descriptions. The best way to do that, again, look at your strategy, list your processes. Your processes will tell you what the individuals in your business need to do on a day-to-day -day basis based on your processes. You take the process list and you categorize them and implement them or list them in job descriptions. Does that make sense? Okay, this is very important to get, to get that because it speaks to what the people who work in your business then should be doing um, that is aligned to your strategy and your goals. Okay. Any questions so far? We're good? All right, so, um, sorry, how far are we time-wise? <coughs> okay, great. So, thanks. So, what, we've, what I've done on this uh, slide is I've taken another category. Remember under the sales and marketing pillar, we've got different categories? This is simply another category, which is sales. If you look at sales as a category, then you list the processes that you need to achieve, that you need to have in place, rather, from a sales perspective, right? From as simple things as scheduling sales appointments, presenting a demo, presenting your proposal, um, having your weekly sales um, and marketing meetings. But basically, these are the list of processes that you will then need to design into what's called a BPM, which is business process modeling. <coughs> All right. I'm just going to ask again to check in with you if we were okay so far. Are we good? All right. Any questions, maybe? Is this valuable so far? Thank you. All right, great. All right, so back to how the approach of implementing processes. All right, we start with our process, with our strategy. We list the business processes, and then we develop an org structure based on what we need to achieve. All right. Ideally, in your strategy, you need to have this in place already. If you don't, your processes will guide you on what kind of roles you need in your business. Okay. From an org structure perspective, we tend to, again, make assumptions and, oh, okay, I've worked for a corporate before, I've worked for a business before, there's always an ops guy, there's always a sales guy, there's always a this and that, okay? What you want to do is you want your strategy and your process list to guide your org structure, okay? It's a very nice way of just doing that. You don't make assumptions, but you actually align everything so that it works nicely together. Based on what we said around the processes and your org structure, you then take your list of processes Right? You match them to the job roles. That's how you come up with the most relevant job descriptions that your company could produce. Right. So maybe this is the second point that I'd like you to, to take away with you. Don't, don't download job descriptions from Google for purpose of implementing in your business. You can use them to get an idea, but you should develop your own, okay, using this. All right. And I'm not going to charge you for this tip, OK? <laughs> sure. Just on, just on this, if you're running a small business, um, so this is the category, you're aligning your job description to your, your strategy, and it's your processes, so this would be the category that you'd love to have people to use. Yeah. Um, if you're in a small business and you're an entrepreneur, you to do things in a certain way, and you're trying to do it all yourself, and then you go, I need to employ somebody to do this, which, which will happen. Best way of doing your job description, do, do the process, but what are you doing in the job? Mm. Uh, this goes for, for, for any human. Mm. Um, and he talks about it today. He says, you, 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 if you want to replace yourself, write down what do you do in that job because you're doing it tomorrow. So you are that job description right now. Yeah. Right? So write down what do you do, actually, right now, and that's what I need somebody else to do. Then compare it to this, which is a little bit more. Theoretical, where when you're writing down what you do, that you might not be doing it right, but you 
Exactly. Thank you for that. Um, it's just you mentioned the E-Myth by Michael E. Gerber. I would highly recommend that you, you, you read that book. You know, it's the Bible as far as we're concerned. And the interesting thing, sorry, the Bible in business. <laughs> okay. What you'd be interested to know is I learned this methodology and adapted it from the people that work for Michael E. Gerber. And the reason why they um, sort of branched out from what he does is because they, they built a business based on the, the idea of, yes, Michael E. Gerber was fantastic in developing his methodologies, but he didn't have ones on how to implement processes. So they developed their own business. I consulted with them, and I was credited, uh, accredited by them uh, to implement uh, their methodologies locally. So this is where it comes from. It's just a, a lineage from, from, from Michael um, E. Gerber. So just back to implementing, um, or rather defining your job descriptions, right? The next thing to do that, uh, the next thing to do after that, excuse me, is to actually design the business processes, right? Remember what we did first. What we did here is we listed them, okay? So once you've listed them, now you need to know how to define and design those processes. And then thereafter, you implement the systems to help automate those processes. What I'm going to show you next is how do we technically design the processes? Um, has anybody, or does anybody know how to, to, to implement processes? I'm sure you've come across them before. Um, has anyone worked with business process modeling before? Great, right. So that's what we're gonna look at. So a business process, more than anything, um, is a set of linked steps and tasks that help you to achieve a certain goal. Right? And that goal normally um, is to, you know, to, to, to take, a, 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 um, call them resources or inputs and convert them into some sort of an output. And that output would typically be something that a, a customer needs to get from a result or from a goal, right? And here's the thing, right? The customer is not always external. In a lot of cases, it's internal as well because you have d different departments that work together. Right? And so always remember that, that processes don't just touch the external customer, but in a lot of cases it actually speaks to the customers inside the business uh, in terms of the different departments and so on. Uh, back to a point you made earlier around you being the entrepreneur, the, the person that founded the business, what we tend to think, and I'm not sure is if this is wrong, it, maybe it's wrong in terms of the law. It's not necessarily illegal, but it's unethical. What we tend to do as entrepreneurs, because we work like machines, we tend to expect other people to do the same. Okay? But unfortunately, those other people are not, are not us, and they don't have the same obligations. Okay? We didn't start our businesses with them. They didn't start our businesses with us. We can't expect the same of them. So when you define job descriptions and tasks and processes that they need to handle, Remember that key performance indicators and areas are extremely important in you defining job descriptions because they help you to condense the list of processes and therefore key responsibilities that you give to someone, someone who works an eight to five or a nine to five as it's called, okay? We sometimes don't sleep because we work until late. We can't expect that of general staff members unless if they explicitly um, you know, say that they're willing but in that case, you need to compensate them in one way or another, okay? What you want to do is make sure that you remain within, um, call it uh, within certain lines, okay? Remember how, 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 how our labor laws, how unfriendly they are towards entrepreneurial activity and entrepreneurial businesses. You want to remain um, within those laws. And the reason why is because people who are willing to go the extra mile are not abound, okay? They're not, they, there isn't a lot of them. So should that person no longer be available to take on the extra load, when you bring in somebody else to replace them, 
there's going to be that, that space, that gap, if you understand what I mean. So try your best not to overload people. Even though they are eager to do it, just remember the day you need to replace them, you will not necessarily find somebody who's as dedicated and willing to work as hard as they are. Okay, so try and keep your, your job descriptions, the key performance areas and indicators that you need achieved to be as standard and general as possible. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so going back to processes, I've got some silly processes, um, at least maybe the second one, um, to kind of give you a high level, high level overview of what processes typically look like. Um, these are written in the business process modeling language. This is a separate one in a different format, different format, but both are using the same language. So if we look at the first one at the top, these squares or rectangles, uh, sorry, what is it called again? <laughs> Shapes, great. <laughs> <laughs> These shapes. <laughs> the thingy magic. <laughs> okay, basically, this is the simplest way to define a process, okay? This one is about selling insurance, right, to someone. Typically, the steps that you would follow is you'd set up an appointment, right, and you would discuss options with um, the, the, the client, right? You make sure they understand the options. And if they do understand the options, do they want the policy, yes or no? If it's a yes, then you calculate the alternatives that they could, uh, uh, you know, to generate the different options they have, and the process could continue. But should they not be interested, um, then it's a no, and then you actually close the process. At a high level, it's as simple as that, okay? But I'm going to show you something here, which I'm going to explain using this example. There's something I always say is, but you're missing the step of going to the kitchen, right? I'll explain what I mean. What do you think is missing here between setting an appointment and discussing options? Sorry? So maybe you'd make the call here, right? Set the appointment, but you actually need to meet, <laughs> right? So sometimes we miss out those, those steps in the processes. And remember what I said about processes and McDonald's is that your processes need to be so detailed that even the dumbest person can do what needs to, to be done. And so that's one of the keys in your processes is try and, and include as many of those steps as possible. So this is my dumb example. It's about making tea, right? When people arrive at your business, um, there's always a trigger. So the little green button, right? You don't just start making coffee for visitors before they arrive, right? <laughs> Actually, somebody needs to ask for coffee. Right? And then you take the order and you ask them, coffee or tea, right? Take the order, and then you go to the kitchen. This is very key in processes. You must go to the kitchen, because you're not going to take the order and start making coffee or tea right there in front of them, right? So you need to go to the kitchen, boil kettle, right? Prepare cro crockery and utensils and so on. Um, and then you place, uh, you prepare the sugar and, and whatnot, right? And place them on a tray and you deliver them. Okay, and then you end the process. You close the process. How are you doing? Okay, simple enough, right? Do you guys have any questions so far? Just a quick comment. Uh, a nice trick to keep that in process is that I'll just review processes in reverse sometimes. So, okay. for example, I want to get paid. So, if I want to get paid, it means I have to send an invoice, it means I have to. Yes. And you go backwards. And yes. sometimes when you go backwards, it might be, for example, with the insurance guy. Yes. Yes. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> of course, nothing's for free, bro. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, once you've done that, the, the, that step, yeah, right. Do you, is, is it uh, worthwhile converting these into like documented uh, procedures? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So basically, at a very high level, these are yeah. you simply are identifying the steps, right? Not necessarily, I guess, um, the step-by-step -step activities within a particular process, right? For example, um, we'll look at 
let's say when you, sorry, when you discuss options, right? If you look at this, discuss options, in that particular task, they, they are products and services that you need to unpack. You know, different calculations that you need to at least uh, ensure that the client or the person you're speaking to understands, right? And depending on the number of tasks and activities that you have inside one particular step, right? You then create what's called a sub-process. Depending on the software that you use to develop your processes, um, some of these um, tasks will then have a, have a little square on the, a little plus sign on them. What it means is when you double click on it, it actually opens up into other levels of processes, right? For example, you may say um, in this instance, yes, discuss options. That particular uh, task will have a plus sign when you double click on it, it actually opens up different documents or different uh, process rather with linked documents that show you what needs to be discussed, templates, um, even systems. It identifies systems that you need to use in order to better, uh, I guess, um, implement or execute that particular task. Okay. All right. These are the different elements that make up a process. Again, this is at a very high level. Um, you typically have a start event, also known as a trigger. You know. I think I was born thinking with processes because people will all typically ask me, but why didn't you do this? I said, no, I was waiting for a trigger. Like, honestly, that's, that's how I function. I wait for something. And when you're an entrepreneur, you want to be able to, you want to put yourself in a situation where you don't just rush out to do things unless if there's a reason why you do them. Okay. So trigger, again, going back to the coffee, don't just make coffee just because you can. Okay. <laughs> you want to make coffee for someone who's actually asked for it. Okay. That's probably the dumbest way I can explain or, or define what a trigger point is. Make sure there's a reason why you do what you do. Don't just do things just because. Because there's a limit uh, on resources that we have. So you want to ensure that you're applying or utilizing those resources pretty effectively. We have a task and activity. This is just a block or box that defines that something needs to happen here. Right? And typically, you want to start that with the verb, i.e., make coffee. Right? Prepare utensils. It's a verb. Something must happen. And then we also have diamond decisions. This is pretty much to identify or show you that a decision needs to be made here. It can either be um, exclusive or non-exclusive, i.e., more than one uh, thing can happen at once, i.e., let me give you an example. If we go back here, this is exclusive. You can't have somebody say yes or no to the options, right? They'll either say yes and you continue one way, or they'll say no and you close the process. Make sense? Right? And then you have other, other ones that are parallel. Parallel could mean if they agree to an option, in order for you to execute it, there are particular steps that you need to follow. And you also need to contact the different department, say maybe the finance department, that say, hey, we have a new client on board. We need to invoice them. Does that make sense? You typically use a diamond decision to identify that. Ten. Thank you. And then you would have um, what's also called intermediate, um, intermediate ends. Sometimes you are ending something because it's still going to continue at another time, i.e., somebody has agreed to a proposal, right? You may close the sales process because they've uh, uh, accepted the proposal, right? In other words, you've closed the sale. But there's still something else that needs to happen. Now you need to onboard them. Make sense? So in some cases, there are intermediate ends to a, uh, to a process, and you want to then ensure that the other person who's starting the next process understands what the trigger is, i.e., a proposal has been closed. Right? We've closed the sale, rather. And therefore, we'll only start onboarding a client because we have a proposal that's been signed. Don't onboard a client until you've got your proof of payment. Ideally, Robin, <laughs> right? Th those are, again, going back to, the, to the, how you apply uh, or utilize your resources. I'm sure we, you know, most of us have been there. We're so excited. Somebody said, yes, great. I'm happy to go ahead with you. you know, but your process says you must wait for a proof of payment. You don't wait because you're too excited. You start, and then the whole thing goes belly up. Right? You apply resources. You implement. 
<laughs> no money comes in. Okay, we've kind of all been there. What processes help you to do, they help you to discipline yourself in order not to use resources where they shouldn't be used. And you also want to ensure that the people who work for you or work with you, they will apply the same consistency around that. And typically the end of a process will be the beginning of the next one that follows after that. Okay, I'm probably trying to break the rules of physics here, i.e. teach something that takes people a couple of years to learn in a short space of time. But we have a full day workshop where we facilitate these kind of workshops uh, for entrepreneurs and sometimes it's enough um, for at least for a certain time in your, in your business, i.e. you're going to take this with you, you'll mull over it for the next couple of days and sometimes it's weeks, right? But something I'd like to say is if you don't implement this soon, your retention levels drop and you're going to forget, okay? And your brain is going to start creating excuses about this is more urgent, this is, that's more urgent, right? But this is extremely important, and there's a huge difference between the two, okay? So I highly recommend that start doing your own research or whatever the case may be to help you with this, but if you want to shorten the process, I'd be more than happy to assist with that. Okay, so we probably are sitting at five minutes now? Seven. Okay. So, folks, as I mentioned, there's quite a lot to cover. I'm going to then not go over the next couple of slides so that we can possibly have a short conversation around it. But the next level after that is implementing systems that help to automate those processes, right? I.e., when you're generating invoices or rather a proposal. You know, uh, space, uh, space Greg knows a lot about, which is you can manually put together a proposal or you can put together, you can, you can get yourself a proposal automation software. It's as simple as that. Right? You can spend hours and hours working on a proposal, or you can use a system that will help you shorten the process and actually help you buy back time. All right. Yes, ma'am. A system. A system. So, so the, the textbook definition, right, is that a system is made up of, of connected parts that work together. So you and the template are a system. Okay, a system is not just a piece of software on its own, but the different things that work together uh, that enable you to, to remember to deliver on that output that we need. But a template in inverted commas could be a system or is a system. Okay, it doesn't have to be a piece of software. It's a combination of parts that work together. Any other questions? All right, so uh, the next two, I guess, images speak to that point I just made, that a system will be made up of processes, people, infrastructure, automation, and information. That is a system, okay? All right, um, typically we would then go into a little bit more technical detail, but I think it's enough uh, for now, at least. All right, is that fine with everyone if we stop here? Okay, great. So as you can see, there's quite a lot technically that speaks to the um, processes and you know, I could go all day long. And then there are swim lanes, if, if you've seen swim lanes before. But basically, if you are a salesperson, you'd have your own specific processes that you want to um, execute. And then you'd have a different department, right? A client even ideally should have their own swim lane. That way you get to see every um, activity that every uh, role or every, call it a department or an actor or a role needs to have in place. If you've seen swim lanes before, that's pretty much what they mean. And how they help is you'll see what you need to do and therefore who the next person in that chain that needs to implement or execute the next step. All right, just again, just to uh, reiterate the point I made. You wanna develop your strategy in terms of implementing your, your processes. Strategy first. List your business processes, define your org chart, design job descriptions, design processes, implement systems to automate. Okay, this is what's gonna buy you that entrepreneurial freedom that you seek. Okay, and it'll help you double the value of your business. Yes, sir? Is that the sixth pillar that's important? Sorry? Is that six pillars? So, sorry, we have, we have uh, the methodology that we use is four pillars. So uh, were you referring to, I guess, this, the, the, 
Yeah, I guess you could look at it that way. All right? But at the end of the day, um, all of these, the, the last four at least, will be included in your operations pillar, okay? Including, how, including the way in which you would transfer the skill of teaching others to, define, to design their own processes, which is another key, um, a key uh, takeaway, at least um, I, I hear a lot of people who attend our workshops and, and, and you know, the other interventions that we do around processes, is that ask the people who do the, actual, the work to actually define those processes. Okay, they'd be ideally uh, the best people to do it because they'll show you how they do it, not necessarily how you, you've always conceived of it. It's always the person that works on that particular process or task that's, got, that's closest to it, obviously, that can um, you know, provide that information. All right. And make it part of your culture. You know? Get everybody to spend 30 minutes or up to an hour every morning just checking their processes. It may be two hours a week or whatever the case may be, but trust me, in the long run, it really helps to build that momentum where it is culture and it is, it is um, you know, a way of life, a way of business um, for everyone in that business to actually implement processes. It'll, it'll help you scale, it'll help you create that operational consistency. And again, I hope that when you walk away today that you don't go back to doing things the same way, okay, unless if they are pristine in the way that you do them. But even then, there's always, you know, if you remember Kaizen, there's always that one little bit of, um, of, of improvement that you can make um, on your, in the way that you do things. All right, thank you very much. Any questions?